Yeah, awesome. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, we're going to talk about cancer cells. We're going to talk about molecular biology. Now, I, for one, am still yet to figure out what that is, but my guest today is going to talk all about it and explain it all for you so I don't have to. <laughs> Her name is Dr. Lemur Gorin, which I found out just earlier. She's from Israel, which is pretty cool. She's the founder of, I'm probably going to butcher this, uh, but can you say the company name for me so I don't get it wrong? Um, sure. The name is Cured. Cure. It's like the cure for cancer. I yeah. like it. The spelling kind of flipped me. <laughs> right. So it's it's the phonetic spelling. It's the phonetic spelling of the word cured. So we ah. spell it K-Y. Yeah. Well, I like it. And it's a cool name. She is a cancer researcher with a PhD in molecular biology that I mentioned just earlier. Her research centers on one of the most important anti-inflammatory molecules found in medical olive oil called can you say that for me, please? It's called oleocanthal. I mean, oleocanthal. actually, it exists in, in every extra virgin olive oil, just not mm. that much in some it, uh, and more in others. This is going <laughs> to be a very interesting conversation indeed. Dr. Gorin discovered one of the mechanisms by which olecanthal is toxic to cancer and showed that olive oils that are rich in olecanthal are effective strategy to kill various types of cancer cells, which is pretty cool. Indeed, Dr. Gorin, can I welcome you so much to Storybox podcast today, my new friend? Thank you, Jay. So happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you here. I apologize in advance if it seemed like I did butcher that introduction, but I believe, believe you <laughs> me, I was actually practicing those words and didn't feel confident enough that I wasn't going to butcher him. So I appreciate your help. On, I know. On that We're front. drawing it to my name, my company name, <laughs> molecule names. I know it's, it's a lot. It's yes. A lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it, it's so good to have you here. And I'm, I'm really glad that you said yes to being on the show. Before we dive into your amazing story, your, why you do what you do in the first place, my very first question for you is, is a question that I love asking all my guests at the very start which is what does success look like for you? Huh. Um, well, would it be okay to say that success is what I live in the present? I mean, I, I feel pretty successful. I, I live my life the way um, I, I think I always wanted to. I don't know if always, but right now um, I lived my life the way I feel it, it's intended to be lived. Um, I feel like I do important work that's very fulfilling and satisfying. I feel that I'm able to um, touch people's life, both with my research and also with what I'm doing in the olive oil field that really definitely touch a lot of people's lives. Um, and I have a pretty good balance between work and family and time for my hobbies, time for um, myself. So I, I feel pretty successful. Mm. I'd say, you know, 15 years ago, 12, 15 years ago, I was not in a good place. I was working a high priority job and I was always stressed and traveling and didn't have time for my family, not eating right. And I, and I wanted to change. And I think, um, I managed to create that change. Mm. And, you know, I, I mean, that's what I would call success. I feel pretty successful right now. <laughs> I love that. Did you find it challenging or difficult for you to actually make those necessary changes in your life? Uh, you know, yes, I know. I mean, you know, change is never easy. No. I have to say I, I'm a person that embraces change. So it wasn't that crazy for me. Uh, when I think about something I want in our goal, uh, I'm the type of person that goes like, okay, <laughs> there must be a way from point A to B. Who knows what's going to be on the way, but there's a way. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a long way. Um, you know, I went back to school um, in my 30s. Um, I actually, I, I've never went to college wow. <laughs> before that. Um, I, I started college when I was 38. Huh. Um, I got my bachelor degree um, right before I turned 40. <laughs> and, um, and then I, I went on and I got my PhD. So that was a little unusual, I think. Um, but uh, and I had two kids, two young kids at home. So that was challenging, but yeah. you know, like I, I did what I wanted to do, what I loved doing and what I believed in. I really, 
you know, I, I, I had that urge. I felt like I can, I can contribute more and I can be more fulfilled if I, if I really do something in the medical field, that's something that's always interested me. And it's something I never, I think dared in my, when I was in my twenties to get into, yeah. um, and I was always in business. And then, you know, when the time was right, I, I knew that's what I wanted to do and I, and I did it. So it's never too late. Wow. That, that is incredible. <laughs> so you went from a business career into sort of a medical field I mean, did you yeah. ever see yourself at all growing up, you being a doctor? Um, when I grew up, I wanted to be a vet. Ah. Um, and then um, I think when I finished high school um, and I was in the Israeli army for a couple of years, um, I just couldn't see myself going to school and studying and I just wanted to uh, have fun. And I got a job and I was making money and I felt successful and very hip. And, mm. um, I was like, Ooh, school and study and university and all of that. Like I can put it off. And then I just put it off for a long time. And then when I finally knew I wanted to get into, um, that field, um, it quickly became clear to me that I, I'm probably going to be a better fit in biomedical research and that, um, I, I like research much more than taking care of patients, whether humans or canines. <laughs> So tell me the story of what sort of interested you in the first place to become a doctor, because I don't think, or maybe this is the case for you, one wakes up and says, oh, I'm going to go be a doctor because <laughs> it's no easy path to actually get that doctorate and say, hey, right. I'm a doctor now. Right. No, that, that was, you know, a pretty long and challenging road, but a very interesting one. So um, I really became interested in the molecular mechanism of cancer and what, you know, what cancer means, like why it develops, how you solve it. As a lay person, I just read a lot of books about it. Yeah. Um, and um, I became fascinated with it. And and that's when I realized I'm like, hey, I, I can do that. I can get slightly more formal education and um, learn more about it and see if there's something I can contribute to the field and something I can do. Um, and, and that was the idea. And actually I was looking for a challenge. I was looking for something that would be, you know, would not be necessarily fast or easy, something that would keep me um, interested for a long time uh, because I tend to get bored really easily. <laughs> um, so I want something that would keep my interest going for a while. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, I first had to get my college degree, um, a bachelor degree, and I got a bachelor degree in biology. I, I did pretty fast, I did two years. I just crammed a lot of classes. And then right away, um, I enrolled in a PhD program um, with a focus in research. Um, and, and the program was um, at Hunter University in New York in molecular biology. And I always knew I wanted to research cancer. So I joined um, a lab that specialized in cancer. Um, I worked in that lab a little bit during my undergrad and I've done some research um, about cellular metabolism. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we were studying um, a protein called mTOR, which is like a master regulator of cellular metabolism. Maybe you've heard about it. Yep. Um, and um, that was um, my area of research for about a year or two. And then um, it shifted when um, I was introduced to oleocanthal, which is now my favorite molecule. Do you have a favorite molecule? Um. I've never, to be honest with you, I've never really thought about it. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't, what's your favorite I didn't, color? What's your favorite food? Nobody asked you what your favorite molecule is. No, that is the first time everyone, yeah. anyone has ever asked me that actually. I mean, I, I failed. I didn't do too well in science as a kid, but I find myself being more interested in it as a 25 year old now. So maybe I might start thinking more about the molecules. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, if you like coffee, your favorite molecule can be caffeine. Or if you like, you know, my favorite molecule is oleocanthal. Right. It's, why, um, why it's, oleocanthal? A, it's a small, well, um, it, it's a really a phenomenally um, interesting small molecule. It's very small, which makes it um, very um, easy to get into human cells when you ingest it with olive oil. And then, um, it can do quite a lot of things. Um, it, it attaches itself to many different proteins and, and areas inside our cells and can do different things depending on a context. And for the most part of what we know about it, um, it does 
beautifully beneficial things. Um, you mentioned in your introduction, and that's the way the molecule was initially discovered, that it's a very strong anti-inflammatory agent. Yeah. Um, it works in the same receptors that um, ibuprofen works. Um, really? It's actually more potent than ibuprofen. Um, it inhibits COX-1 and COX-2 receptors. That um, These are the targets of ibuprofen. Um, and oleocanthal is, is a natural molecule that does that. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. It does more things. And uh, what I was trying to um, study is um, what it does in cancer cells. And um, early on, we knew it's toxic to cancer cells and less toxic to normal cells. But it was not clear why. Because, you know, usually a molecule, it does something. It would do the same thing in every cell in our body, right? That, um, um, I mean, there are some special things about cancer cells. Um, so it turns out that um, oleocanthal interacts with um, part of our cells, or it's called an organelle in our cells, that's called lysosome. And um, you probably know about lysosome, but if somebody doesn't know, lysosomes, many people describe them as the recycling centers of the cells. Um, so they're like sacs that sit in our cells. And... Um, our cells use them to recycle big molecules. They're getting chopped into small building blocks and then extruded out um, and used for growth and for different functions that cells need them. Um, they're also used to um, send toxins out of the cells and things like that. So it's a very important part of the cells. And apparently, um, Many, many cancer cells are very much reliant on activities of lysosomes, mm. um, especially because when you think about um, tumors at the early stages, when they start, um, they're not vascularized. They don't get um, blood supply. Yeah. So they don't get constant supply of nutrients, right? They need to create the nutrients themselves. They scavenge for neighboring cells, they're recycling their own cellular content in order to create um nutrients and building blocks. So lysosomes are very important for cancer cells. Uh, they're also, by the way, very important for cancer cells that become drug resistant because one of the mechanisms that um, cancer becomes drug resistant is the ability to um, isolate those drugs that we fit in them and just like shun them out of the cells. And they also do that through lysosomes. So Sometimes when um, drugs stop being effective against cancer, the reason for that is because the cancer cell overactivate their lysosomes and send the drugs out and pretty much does nothing. Yeah. So what we found out is that um, all your cantal can, in a way that we still don't understand, we don't know exactly how, destabilizes lysosome, almost pokes holes in lysosomes, kind of make them very permeable. And they lose their functions. And cancer cells are just much more sensitive to that than normal cells. Um, and it's that slight difference between how important that process is to cells that are um, cancer and cells that are not um, that makes this molecule very um, valuable um, in the fight against cancer. Now, um, as far as I know, there's no doctor or treatment or drug company that want to try to sell all your cantal and, and tell you, okay, take all your cantal that's going to cure your cancer. And frankly, I don't know if um, they should do that because uh, we all consume, hopefully, that molecule naturally mm -hmm. if we consume extra virgin olive oil. Yeah. And um, that's why I found it especially interesting because it's something that exists in nature. It's just up to you how much of it you consume. Yeah. Well, in the Western world, this is not necessarily a, a popular sort of message to be sending out. I think it's been blocked a lot of the times. Like for myself here in Sydney, Australia, um, I haven't heard of the benefits. I didn't even know of the canthol and, and its benefits so mm -hmm. all I all I know is that if someone gets cancer, they go through radiation, they go through all those sort of things. They end up on a number of drugs. Um, my dad actually has uh, cancer at the moment. We mm -hmm. just we I'm recently sure found out in his in his it's got its own blood supply, um, and mm -hmm. yeah, so he's he's got it. But 
doing research into how to like naturally heal cancer, we didn't come across uh, olecanthal or olive oil mm-hmm. benefits or anything like that. So I guess what I'm asking is how do we, or how are, we, are you able to get this message more out there in, in a broader sense so that people know about this, like healing cancer the natural mm-hmm. way? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's really, I think it's a two part effort. And for several years, I was participating in one side of it, which is the scientific research. Mm. And now I'm starting to participate in the other side of it, which is advocacy and really explaining to the world these things and making olive oil, the right type of olive oil available and um, encouraging producers of olive oil to think about it when they're producer olive oils. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, but on a science front, I think um, we really need a better understanding of um, how this molecule and other important molecules in extra virgin olive oil that are called polyphenols, mm. um, how do they work and what do they do? Because um, we know that olive oil is good for you and there's plenty of evidence out there that um, higher consumption of olive oil um, extends your life. Mm. Um you have less chances of developing cancer. Uh, we're not really sure if the role is in cancer prevention or once you have cancer is more in treatment. It's probably a little bit of both, but I would say probably stronger on a prevention side. So we just need to know more so we can talk about it and explain about it and, and educate. I wouldn't want to say something that's not true, that's not, and that hasn't been proven yet, you know, yeah. especially as a scientist. I would never say, oh, this is a proof or this is a fact. I, say, I would say we have a lot of evidence that something is true or we really believe or there's a lot of supporting data. Um, so we need more of that. We need to understand more of that because we don't understand enough. So that would be one thing. Um, and as I mentioned, there's, um, there are a lot of different molecules, a lot of polyphenols in olive oils that are important and each one of those can explain a little piece of the puzzle, why olive oil is healthy and how come people consume more olive oil, live longer and healthier. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, we just know it to be true. We don't know necessarily why. So that's one part of the thing. And um, the other part is really, um, and that's what I'm very excited about being involved with right now, is um, uh, reclaiming that because, you know, like a lot of the other foods we eat, um, uh, you know, like the, the industrialization of agriculture and uh, diminished the, the nutrient value and, and much of the food we eat is food that, uh, you know, not, not necessarily good for us. Um, not only it wasn't produced in a way that is, is sustainable and environmentally right and supports the people who make it, but also as far as uh, nutrient content is, is, is not sufficient. And most of the cooking oils that people use these days, and even most of the olive oil that people use around the world, is not of that best quality or not of the quality that can support um, that. Um, I wouldn't say that most of the olive oil that's being consumed and sold um, is um, uh, has the ability to cure cancer. Yeah. Um, Olive oil is definitely a healthier cooking oil than many other oils because of the um, uh, fat content yep. um, that it contains. Um, but it has some olive oils have the ability to be even more healthy and even work better in disease prevention. Um, not because of the fat content, but because of those other molecules that they contain. Uh, but right now, there's very, very few producers of olive oil that make their olive oil in this way. Um, it's harder, it takes longer, it's more expensive. Um, but if there would be consumer demand, if people would know about it and, and would buy it and would agree to invest in that, um, there'll be more of it. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm glad that I'm, I'm able to spread this message as far as we possibly can, because I think it's, it's valuable information, but for the kinds of olive oil, because there is a lot out there, I know, like different brands, different companies produce it. And then there's extra virgin olive oil and there's olive oil. And you got the other mm-hmm. crappy ones that come right. off that that aren't really olive oil. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So how do we know when we go to the shop? 
because I'm here in Sydney, Australia. You're here. You're there in over uh, in America. When we walk into the shop, how do we know when we're buying uh, a can of olive oil or a bottle of right. olive oil? How do we know that it's actually got those healing benefits like the olecanthal or the polyphenols in it to help fight against cancer? Sure. So um, unless you find um, an olive oil bottle or can that has the information stated on it, um, it's a little tricky, but there are a few hints or a few steps you can take. So first and foremost, um, fresh olive oil is always better. Yep. And um, and by the way, I'll take it one step backwards. So when I say olive oil, I really mean extra virgin olive oil. So if the olive oil doesn't say extra virgin, it means it's refined to a certain degree. And and we don't need that. We don't need that. That's that's doesn't help anybody. <laughs> um, so I'm really talking about nice. extra virgin. That's the <laughs> lowest, lowest, lowest bar is yeah. extra virgin olive oil. Um, and that doesn't really cost more than the olive oil that says just olive oil without extra virgin. However, um, and so the next step, as I mentioned, is, is it being fresh because um, every extra virgin olive oil contains all your cantal, contains polyphenols, um, sometimes in just pretty small amounts. And um, the shelf life of that is a couple of years. They start to degrade after, you know, like it's a gradual process. After a year, after two years, it's not in the same state. Um, those molecules oxidize, even in storage. So first, see if you can find the harvest date on a bottle. If a bottle is a harvest date, um, you know when it was produced, and then you go like, oh, it was produced in the last year or last year and a half. Excellent. I'll buy it. I'll use it right now. It's fine. Um, I would say as a rule of thumb, you should only use extra virgin olive oil in the first two years after it was produced. Okay. Now, the thing is, it doesn't really go bad. It just loses its nutrient power. So big manufacturers, uh, they would not put a harvest date. They would put some kind of like a fake best buy date, which they can put three, four or five years ahead because olive oil, it, it doesn't go bad. Yeah. So you, you can find olive oil that says, like, oh, geez, that's good until February 2024. Yeah. Oh, that's probably still good. Yeah, but it was made already two years ago. So that, that's not great. Um, another thing, again, and we're talking about storage to try to um, ensure yourself against improper storage. Um, never buy olive oil in plastic. Plastic is really bad for olive oil. So only glass or metal. Metal is fine. Um, and opaque containers. So nothing that's clear, that's been sitting on a shelf exposed to light because the enemies of olive oil are what cause it to oxidize, mm -hmm. oxygen. So if it's being open, um, heat and light. Um, so try to find something fresh, something that looks like it's being protected. Um, you can also go to the manufacturer's website. Sometimes they do provide um, like the batches of when it was made, but probably your best bet is to taste it. And that taste um, doesn't lie. You can figure out what's a fresh olive oil. You can even taste the polyphenols, and I'll tell you how, um, if you train your palate. I think some of us, um, and I was definitely in that category, I always use a lot of olive oil, but I didn't even know I was using old rancid olive oil. You get used to that rancidity, so you have to take a moment and, and realize that and think and, and really taste it put it into a spoon or a small shot glass and, and taste its relic in your mouth and make sure you don't feel anything rancid, anything. It's actually good olive oil should not taste oily. <laughs> it, it's a fruit juice, right? Olives are fruit. The olive oil is a fruit juice. So it should taste a little fruity, um, a little herby. Um, if, if it can taste like green, that's the best. And you can also smell it and you can smell a green fresh aroma, that's usually your, best, your better assurance that the olive oil is good. And the polyphenols, uh, most of the polyphenols are bitter. So oh. bitter in olive oil is good. It's different than rancid. Rancid is not bitter. Rancid is something, you know, you feel kind of like not great, right? And bitter, you go like, it's bitter. And, and that's a desirable quality of olive oil. And especially all your candle has its own sign or its own taste. All your cantal, 
will sting the back of your throat. So kind of at the back of your tongue, top of your throat, you would feel like something peppery almost, something very robust and peppery. It might want to, you might feel like you have to cough. Yeah. And that's a true sign of all your cantal. So um, whenever you um, experience a taste oils that make you cough a little bit and they're a little peppery, that's a sign they're good and they have all your cantal in them. Mm. This is fascinating stuff. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna remember this like when I go to the shop next and buy olive oil. Um, but I'm interested in okay, so we got our bottle of olive oil. How much do we need? So there's a couple of questions in mm -hmm. this. Sorry, right? I'm asking so many. I, I would just want to unpack it the right way. But how much olive oil do we need? within a day's context, do we drink the whole bottle in one go or do we, that's probably crazy, but is it crazy? <laughs> um, <laughs> and then how long do we need to drink the olive oil for in order to start seeing, say someone does have cancer in to start seeing signs of it actually working and, and curing the cancer? Okay. So, um, Many of the answer to these questions, we just don't know yet, yep. but some we do and some we have good clues for it. So I'll tell you. So, um, and, and again, and I'm trying to answer you only based on scientific research that yeah. I'm aware of that I read. So as far as how much do we need, um, there've been a lot of studies that looked at how much olive oil people consume and then correlated it to the state of health. Mm. And apparently, um, people, especially in the med Mediterranean, people in Spain, in Greece, and Italy, um, they're very large consumption uh, uh, consumers of olive oil naturally, right? Um, but when people consume about two to three tablespoons a day, um, in those studies, they they're considered as consuming, you know, mid to high levels of olive oil, mm. and. Um, among these people, we definitely see clear, clear difference um, when we compare them to people who consume not at all or maybe a little bit on average a spoon a day. Um, and we see that effect on um, mortality, any kind of mortality from cancer, from heart disease, from neurodegeneration. So that protective effect probably starts at about daily consumption of, of around two or three tablespoons. Yeah. And this is... Um, Again, um, most of the studies were either done in Mediterranean countries, there's been some studies in the US, but in Mediterranean countries, we're assuming, okay, they're consuming extra virgin olive oil that's fresh, that's normally what comes to market. So that's like the average extra virgin olive oil, it's nothing special. Yeah. Um, we believe that um, if you consume olive oil that's even higher in polyphenols, such as oleocantal, you can probably consume less to get the same effect. And if you consume the same amount or more, that's probably when you're getting into doses that, um, in addition to providing some prevention, might be able to lend a hand and assist even if you're already developing some kind of disease like diabetes, like neurodegeneration, even uh, and heart disease and cancer. So some other studies, for example, um, and, and you ask, the next question you asked me is like, when would you see the effect if, let's say, you're not a heavy user of olive oil or if you're like just using the wrong olive oil and now you want to start using the right one. Um, so the studies, um, there aren't studies that looked at that effect on cancer, but I can tell you about studies that looked at that effect on cardiovascular health. Um, and that's pretty fast. Yeah. So within six weeks, of, uh, people who normally did not um, have a lot of olive oil in their diet or not at all, if they changed their fat consumption from animal-based fat to um, high quality extra virgin olive oil, um, two tablespoons a day, uh, within six weeks, you saw already markers of um, heart health and cardiovascular health um, improving tremendously. Yeah. So that's something, especially when it comes to, so when it comes to heart health, we know that that can happen pretty fast. Um, on other disease, there's less data. It's harder to measure. And also there haven't been too many human studies, yeah. um, but, um, there've been animal studies, both on things like, um, Alzheimer's symptoms and cancer. And, um, 
we also know that, um, and again, it, it's hard to tell because animals sleep, you know, like we do an experiment with mice, a lifespan of mouse is, is two years, three years. Um, but a few weeks of um, intervention with olive oil or certain molecules like all your cantal usually are enough to see um, the results that we see, like tumor shrinkage and, um, and, life, and lifespan expansion. Yeah. What would it take for you to actually start doing some more human trials uh, with olecanthal, with olive oil to just actually do this test a bit more effectively to see how long it actually takes for this to work? Um, money. <laughs> so you know how trials work and drugs and everything somebody needs to make money at the end yep. and um you know there, there's some olive oil companies that you know maybe have slightly deep pockets but they're nothing like a pharmaceutical company yeah. <laughs> um so <laughs> you know you need to have the interest you need to have the resources to do that and, and we do that on, on small scales um and there are some human trials, small scales, there, there's actually less obstacle. Um, olive oil is an FDA approved substance, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, really what we need is, is um, are the support of the clinicians and um, the research hospitals. Um, you know, just before the pandemic started, I was actually um, in a planning stage of, of a trial with a very um, um, important cancer hospital in New York City on, um, on, the effect of um, adding um, high phenolic, uh, so olive oil with a lot of polyphenols, we call it high phenolic. So high phenolic olive oil to diets of um, of um, cancer patients that are ongoing standard therapy and see if that has any effect. But um, that was in January and February of um, 2020. And then, you know, when it came time to um, planning the world change. So it, it takes the interest of, of, of researchers and peoples and doctors. It start, it's almost like a grassroots type of approach, I would say. Yeah. You mentioned money there, which is a massive factor because at the end of the day, it's got to be seen like they're going to make more money. And it's like, if you were to bring out this natural cure for a disease that has been around for centuries that a lot of people have died from, sadly, and people are, are searching for cures all the time, whether it's natural or whether it's going to your doctor and, and pumping yourself full of radiation just to cu cure the cancer uh, or having operations, you're spending thousands of dollars to do that. It almost feels like there's going to be a lot of pushback on saying, hang on a minute, no, 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 this is, no, uh, we want, this is going to make us more money if we go down this side rather than the natural side. So I completely understand like what you must be feeling <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. We're trying to get yeah. something that's super important, super valuable out there. But yeah, sadly it all comes down to the almighty dollar, unfortunately. Yeah. But you know, there, there, there is um, um, a light spot. So in, in, in that equation of the power players and how things goes, um, you know, the, the health insurance actually have an interest um, to oh. lower their costs, right? So health insurance, it's in their interest to basically tell people eat healthier. And, you know, in Europe, um, it, it's already possible. In, in, in Greece, um, you can go to the doctor um, mm. with, um, um, you know, high cholesterol. And uh, instead of prescribing you statins, the doctor is allowed to prescribe you high phenolic olive oil. And you can go to the pharmacy and get a high phenolic olive oil as part of your insurance plan. Um, and it has to be a particular olive oil. So the um, EU equivalent of the American FDA, I forget what it's called now, health authority, um, they define what's a high phenolic olive oil is. It has to have a certain contents of phenols and they acknowledge that it's um, heart healthy and doctors can pretty much prescribe it. Yeah. Um, and that's one country, but um, I, you know, I, I'm a believer. Uh, I am too. Today. I'm a little I believe, I believe, blue. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I believe like we, we can get to that space because um, again, as long as it serves economic principles and, and it serves um, health insurance and it serves our government mm. um, to, to find um, cheaper ways of, of um, treating people and, and, and for disease prevention. Yeah, I, I, I mean, in, one of my goals is, uh, you know, 
getting into that field. And, you know, I am in a small niche of that, but, um, was, you know, when, when you go to a doctor, um, you know, the first thing they should ask you is what do you eat? Yeah. You know, like uh, that's, that's the most basic thing. What do you eat? Mm. You know, that's not the first question that I get asked <laughs> to be honest. Like when I'm at my doctor's office, they're like, what's wrong? Tell me what's wrong. They don't say, what do you eat? Because that's like kind of like the last thing on their list. Um, yeah. I, I they ask you how many alcoholic drinks you have a week, right? Yeah, but they don't ask smoke? you like, you, you know, like how many portions of vegetables do you eat? Yes. Versus burgers. I mean, it's, it's kind of that side of things for me looking at it, that like, you know, looking at the overall aspect of health, you're just looking at a very specific thing that you've been trained to talk about, which is why I like conventional medicine quite a bit. Conventional medicine has helped me a lot cure things that modern medicine didn't. And they tried, mm -hmm. believe you me, <laughs> with, with my own health journey. But my, my, my good friend, Dr. Stephen Gundry, he's a huge advocate for olive oil. I mean, he takes mm -hmm. shots of olive oil for goodness sake. I mean, that's, that's awesome to see. And you, and you, and you, and you find that weird? No, I don't no, no, actually. No, no, no. That's, I love that's it. what everybody should be doing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Jo join us, Jay. You yes. should be taking shots of olive oil. With um, Dr. Gundry's birthday, I think it was uh, last year, he had this, um, you know, this thing of, of let's do a shot for, for my birthday. And I did a shot for his birthday here in Australia. <laughs> so I'm like, yes, awesome. <laughs> it tasted, mm -hmm. it was a different taste. Uh, I have to say that, but it worked. <laughs> um, I do have to ask you though, like when it comes to olive oil is, and speaking about taking shots of olive oil, does it still have like um, olecanthal and, and the polyphenols if we cook it to oblivion? Um, the short answer, yes. Oh. The long answer is yes, but less. So you remember I told you that, um, heat is the enemy of the olive oil. Yep. Um, but it's a gradual process. So if you start with an olive oil, that's really high phenolic, that has a lot of phenols and you saute your vegetables with it. Um, so two things will happen. One is that gradually, depending on the temperature and the time, you will start losing, you start oxidizing some of those really good beneficial polyphenols and you'll lose some of them, but not all of them. I mean, if you heat the olive oil, um, you know, like in really high heat and just kept it in the pan for four or five hours, you might lose all of them. But if you just saute mm -hmm. something for 10, 15 minutes, you might lose 15, 20%, but you'll still have plenty. Okay. The other thing that would happen and studies have shown that is that um, the polyphenols transfer into the food into the vegetables. Mm. So that is a myth. There used to be this myth that you're not supposed to cook with olive oil uh, because of different reasons. Like one is because, oh, it can smoke in some temperatures. Um, so that's been completely busted. The smoking point of oils actually does not correlate to how suitable it is to cook with them. Mm. Um, it's very easy to understand why people think that. Like you see smoke and you're going, oh, well, it's smoking. That's probably not good. Um, but it also has to do with water content because think about you heat something, oil, water, that's when it's going to smoke. Um, but the other thing they found out is that um, certain oil and, and olive oil was proven to be the best one, extra virgin olive oil, um, create less harmful compounds once um, they're cooked with food or they're called um, polar compounds that contain aldehydes. Yeah. Um, so uh, cooking with extra virgin olive oil generates the least of those harmful aldehydes and on the other hand enriches the food most in beneficial moieties right, and those polyphenols. So actually extra virgin olive oil, especially high phenolic, is, is very suitable for cooking. Wow. I, yeah. Yeah. You get more benefit. You get more benefits to, to, uh, when you use it raw, but you don't lose that much. This is fascinating stuff. Do you, does your company make your own olive oil? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. yeah. We make it in I mean, Can we get it in Australia or you ship? Um, actually, yeah, actually, yes. Yeah. So, um, um, our, my, my partners are in a small island in Corfu called Greece and we make a couple of brands. Um, one of our brand, the governor is available in Australia now. So if you look up the governor, it is available in Australia. 
Um, but talking about that, if you have a lot of listeners from Australia, let me like just put something in there. I would love to find also partners in Australia that make mm. truly high phenolic olive oil and especially high in all your cantal. I was looking for that, but I couldn't find any. And the reason I'm so interested in that is you remember when I said that the freshest olive oil is the best? Yep. So olive oil is harvested once a year. And when it's harvested early in the season, it's better. When the olives are unripe, we didn't get a chance to get into that, but it's it's always better. Uh, but the harvest happens only once a year. And you know, if you consume the olive oil a year after it was made, it's still good, it's still great. But depending on a variety of olives in the storage, again, you might have lost anywhere from something negligible, 10%, 15% of the beneficial uh, molecules, but sometimes a little more, sometimes 20, 25%. Um, and, you know, because your season in Australia is different than our season, um, if I find producers in Australia, I can supply my customers the freshest olive oil. I can sell Australian olive oil for six months out of the year and Mediterranean olive oil for six months out of the year. And then everybody will get the freshest olive oil always. I was thinking really nice. just the same thing. So if anyone is listening to this and you know someone that is in that field, please do get in touch, which kind of leads me to my second last question for you, Dr. Goran, because I know your time is incredibly valuable. Uh, where do you want people to connect with you, learn more about you? And and yeah. Oh, sure. Um, well, um, social media or website, it's the same, it's Cured, and it's spelled K-Y-O-O-R-D, cool. which is the phonetic um, spelling of the word Cured. Um, so yeah, we're cured.com or on Instagram and Facebook, Cured, and you can read more. You can sign up to our newsletter. I always send a lot of um, interesting studies. There's a study that just came out um, this week um, that looked at 90,000 um, adults in the U.S. over 28 years and uh, showed, surprise, surprise, that the more olive oil you consume, the longer you live. <laughs> but it's been a very, very, very important study. That again took 28 years. So um, I looked at that study, I analyzed that, and, and these type of things are always available on our newsletter. Amazing. Well, I know that we didn't touch on this, but I did maybe another time want to talk about how olive oil affects your immune system, how olive mm -hmm. oil affects other aspects of your entire health, your brain function, all that sort of stuff. If you have researched that, of course. So maybe there's like so much to talk about with just one particular yeah. good item. <laughs> it's awesome. All right. Well, like, we should thing. do a follow up in a few months or next year. We'll, we'll do a definitely do a follow up. But my final question for you, Dr. Gore, and this is my all time favorite question. I love asking all my guests at the very end. It's a hypothetical one, but I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll just call it magic for sake of argument. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Ooh. Um, well, I, I would like some of the things that we're talking about right now to seem... Um, quaint and kind of like, ah, oh, ha, 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 yeah, now everybody knows these things and, and people eat right and people you have to use less medicine. And um, probably like some people would not show up for my 100th um, birthday because many more people would live to be that age <laughs> because we're really able to make um, a little bit of revolution in the food industry and, and how we treat food. And that's something that's really dear to me. Oh, and of course, they have to show um, good um, surfing clips of me. I, I need to become a better surfer. And that, that would be nice. Yeah. You might have to teach me how to surf when I get over to America <laughs> one of these <laughs> days because even though I'm Australian, I don't know how to surf. It's oh, my God. Pretty, it's pretty funny. I probably should, but um, yeah, <laughs> I'll get there one day. But thank you so yeah. much, Dr. Goran, for your incredible work. I mean, oh, just thank something you for having that, me. I, I, I'm fascinated by, so this was like a geek, the geek in me, geek in me was coming out, if you, if you saw. <laughs> um, I tried to figure out which questions to ask you the most and which were most prevalent. So we're definitely going to have to do a part two, but thank you so much for joining me today for part one of the Storybox podcast. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Jay. It's been fun.